uh, minority members, staff that uh, I may proceed. He'll be here shortly. And uh, we're going to uh, call the meeting to order. The Subcommittee on Domestic Policy of the Committee of Oversight and Government Reform will now come to order. How are you, Mr. Jordan? Joined by our ranking member, Mr. Jordan. Thank you. Today's hearing is the third held by our subcommittee on the subject of the pollution from mercury used in dentistry. This hearing, the first to be held during the Obama administration, will examine actions undertaken by the EPA and other stakeholders to improve measurement of and limit mercury pollution from dental sources. Now, without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. And without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. Mercury, especially methyl mercury, is a very serious environmental and public health threat. It is persistent and bioaccumulative in nature and can cause birth defects, chronic illnesses, mental disorders, autoimmune disorders, and neurodegenerative diseases in human beings. Young children and unborn fetuses are particularly susceptible to mercury toxicity. The largest source of mercury air emissions is smoke from coal burning power plants, about 50 tons per year. The next tier of major mercury air emissions is attributable to incineration of automobiles and mercury switches and pollution from industrial and commercial boilers. Each of these emissions, about 7.5 tons per year. Today's hearing addresses what scientific evidence suggests may be an unrecognized member of that second tier of major source of mercury pollution. Currently, dentists use more than 20 tons of mercury per year in dental fillings, replacing or repairing current fillings or putting new fillings in. Where does all that waste mercury go? Often it goes down the drain, and if there isn't a major storm causing the sewers to overflow, the waste mercury ends up in a public water treatment works where it settles into biosolid sludge. <coughs> Many municipalities burn the sludge in incinerators. The mercury in incinerated sludge is vaporized, goes into the air. Over 1,000 tons of mercury are currently in the teeth of Americans. Millions of Americans opt for cremation. At death, when corpses are cremated, the mercury in their teeth goes up in the air. How much dental mercury ends up in the air? According to official estimates from the EPA, the amount of mercury released into air when sewage sludge is incinerated is small, about, uh, about 0.6 tons per year. According to EPA, the amount of mercury emitted into the air from cremation is also insignificant, about 0.3 tons per year. But actual mercury emissions from uh, crematoria and sludge incinerators may be more than five times greater than EPA's official estimates. EPA itself admits its estimates of air emissions from sewer sludge incinerators are poor and unreliable. EPA's estimate for emissions from crematoria is also suspect because it's based entirely on tests conducted more than 10 years ago on a single crematorium. No effort was made at the time to determine whether or not the test was conductive as a representative sample. In spite of these deficiencies, EPA never changed its air admission est estimates for sludge incinerators and crematoria, and are repeated in the EPA's written testimony today. But we have found one EPA scientist whose scientific research disputes the official estimates. He'll testify today on his own behalf because his scientific work has never been fully or officially adopted by EPA. But EPA has had plenty of time to consider his findings and revise the official estimates. He's been presenting at conferences since 2005 and in 2007, published his findings that EPA's official estimates significantly undercounted mercury air emissions. In a previous hearing, this subcommittee received testimony establishing that the true range of mercury air emissions attributable to dental mercury could be as high as 7 to 9 tons per year. 
that would put dental mercury emissions on par with major source of mercury air emissions. If EPA underestimated the extent of the environmental problem caused by dental mercury, it's also overestimated the amount of cooperation dentists have voluntarily given towards preventing amalgam from leaving dental offices and wastewater. The technology for capturing mercury is known as, amal as the amalgam separator. In 2008, EPA effectively agreed with comments submitted by the American Dental Association, which asserted in part that significant numbers of dentists are voluntarily purchasing amalgam separators and are thereby reducing the amount of mercury their offices use and wash down the drain. Thus, EPA granted an exception for dental offices from mandatory effluent guidelines in 2008. Instead, EPA entered into a voluntary memorandum of understanding in the last days of the previous administration to encourage dentists to adopt amalgam separators to prevent the mercury that they use every day from going down the drain to the publicly owned water treatment facilities. But what happens in practice is far different from the assumptions that justify the exception and a memorandum of understanding. Unfortunately, in state after state, dentists have by and large been slow to adapt mercury sep separators unless they were facing mandatory regulations. According to testimony received today from the Environmental Council of the States, a national association of state environmental protection agencies, quote, in many jurisdictions, dental amalgam separator installation rates were low unless there was a mandatory component, unquote. That conclusion is consistent with our staff report published in September 2008, and it's consistent with the sales data trends from the largest manufacturer of mercury separators. Dentists do not respond in large number to the purely voluntary programs to encourage mercury separator <coughs> use. Indeed, the American Dental Association promulgated voluntary uh, best management practices for disposing of amalgam waste in 2007. But the majority of dentists who have installed separators at this time reside in states or local jurisdiction where separator use is a requirement. Today's hearing will focus primarily on whether or not the EPA's memorandum of understanding can achieve its purpose in its current form. In preparation for this hearing, my staff has assessed progress made under the Memorandum of Understanding. What we found is that every milestone established by it has been missed in nearly one and a half years since it was signed. Serious questions arise about whether the Memorandum of Understanding has inherent deficiencies, such as can the parties to the memorandum deliver a high rate of dentist compliance with best management practices for amalgam pollution prevention? Would the MOUs chance of success increase if additional parties were allowed to become signatories? What measure is EPA pre prepared to take to ensure that the failures to date of the Memorandum of Understanding process do not predict the ultimate failure of the EPA's efforts to encourage dentists to remove mercury waste from wastewater before it leaves the dentist offices? We hope to get the answer to these and other questions today. Thank you for being here. Recognize Mr. George. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing to examine the Environmental Protection Agency's role in the use and disposal of dental amalgam by the dental industry. I just have a short statement. Uh, dental amalgam, or the silver fillings that many of us have, are a compilation of metals, mainly mercury. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, there is little scientific evidence that dental amalgam poses a health threat. However, I know this is a controversial area. Today we are focusing on the EPA's role in the disposal of dental amalgam. My understanding is that the industry and the regulators are conversant on this topic and, I have, ex and, ha and have executed a memorandum of understanding. I'm interested in learning how that MOU is working, how it was developed, etc. Uh, I would like to point out that traditionally regulation of the dental industry is a matter reserved to the states. A very important principle I think we need to keep in mind as we think about our federal system and as we move through this hearing and look at this issue. Therefore, I hope to hear more about what states are doing to assist in this concern. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you again for putting this together. I appreciate the working relationship that we have, and I want to thank the witnesses who are here today for their participation. With that, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Jordan. Uh, if there are no additional opening statements, the subcommittee will now receive testimony from the witness before us. I want to start by introducing Ms. Nancy Stoner. Ms. Stoner joined the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency as a Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Office of Water on February 1st of this year. This is Ms. Stoner's second tenure with EPA as she directed the Office of Planning and Policy Analysis in the Office of Enforcement and Compliance Assurance from 1997 to 1999. More recently, she was co-director of the National Resources Defense Council's Water Program. Prior to that, she served as project director and attorney for the Clean Water Project for nearly 10 years. Deputy Assistant Administrator Stoner, thank you for appearing before the subcommittee today. In view of the Division of Responsibilities EPA, Ms. Stoner is able to speak authoritatively on issues pertaining to water and to the Memorandum of Understanding on Reducing Dental Amalgam Discharges. 
We'll send questions in writing to EPA concerning EPA's efforts to measure mercury air emissions. Now, uh, Ms. Stoner, as you know, it's the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that you rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I, I thank you. Let the record reflect that the witness is answered in the affirmative. I ask uh, Ms. Stoner that you now give a brief summary of your testimony and to keep this summary under five minutes in duration. Your entire written statement will be included in the hearing record. I ask that you begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for that uh, lovely introduction. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today before you and Ranking Member Jordan about the agency's policies on, uh, on mercury and, in particular, dental amalgam. Uh, mercury is widespread and persistent in the environment and under certain conditions can be transformed by microorganisms into methyl mercury, the form of mercury of greatest concern in the U.S. where exposures occur primarily through fish consumption. EPA is using its legislative mandates under the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act to reduce the U.S. Contribu contribution to the worldwide environmental mercury burden. Under the Clean Air Act, EPA has substantially limited U.S. emissions of mercury to the atmosphere through Maximum Achievable Control Technology, MACT, and Solid Waste Combustion Incineration Regulations. As a result, the U.S. has cut its emissions by more than 90 percent from two of the three largest categories of sources, municipal waste combustion and medical waste incineration since 1990. For the other largest category, coal-fired power plants, EPA is now in the process of developing a MAC standard that will address mercury and other hazardous air pollutants. Just last month, EPA proposed MAC regulations to significantly reduce mercury air emissions from another large source cate category, industrial, institutional, and commercial boilers. EPA also plans to finalize air emission standards in December of this year to address mercury and other air pollution pollutant emissions from both new and existing sewage sludge incinerators. EPA is committed to reducing mercury discharges to our nation's waters. In April, EPA published final guidance for implementing the January 2001 ambient methylmercury water quality criterion for the protection of public health. This document will help protect waters and human health by giving guidance to states, territories, and authorized tribes for adopting a fish tissue-based methylmercury water quality criterion into their water quality standards. Last fall, EPA also initiated effluent guideline rulemaking under the Clean Water Act to address mercury and other wastewater discharges from power plants. Dental amalgam contributes a small portion of all mercury released globally to the environment from human activities. However, at the local level, data indicate that discharges from dental facilities can be a significant contributor to mercury in the environment. Mercury-containing amalgam waste may find their way into the environment when old mercury-containing fillings are drilled out and waste amalgam materials are flushed into chair-side drains entering the sewer system. Dental facilities may employ a variety of controls and management practices to reduce the discharge of mercury amalgam in wastewater. Application of these practices in conjunction with traps and vacuum pump filters can reduce discharges of mercury containing amalgam in wastewater by more than 75 percent. Amalgam separators remove particulate mercury amalgam and in combination with traps and vacuum pump filters achieve better than 95 percent removal. Some of the waste amalgam particles that reach the sewer system settle out in the sewers, and some are carried to sewage treatment plants. The processes used at sewage treatment plants remove 90 to 95 percent of the mercury present in wastewater on average. The mercury remo removed from wastewater then resides in the biosolids or sewage sludge generated during wastewater treatment. Preventing dental amalgam from getting into the sewer in the first place reduces the amount of dental amalgam and thus mercury in wastewater. Amalgam separators are also available at relatively low cost to remove fine particles of waste amalgam. Several studies, including one conducted by EPA's Environmental Technology Verification Program, shows separators are highly effective. Another way to reduce the amount of amalgam entering the sewers is for dentists to use mercury-free fillings. Alternatives to mercury-containing dental amalgams exist. As fewer mercury-containing dental amalgams are used, the amount of mercury in the environment will decline. 
Every other year, EPA publish, publishes a final effluent guidelines program plan. The plan addresses both categories of direct and indirect discharges. As part of its 2008 Effluent Guidelines Program Plan, EPA received comments from the American Dental Association and the National Association of Clean Water Agencies on dental amalgam. These comments led to discussions of voluntary efforts and ultimately served as the basis for the Memorandum of Understanding on Reducing Dental Amalgam signed in December 2008. The purpose of the agreement between EPA, ADA, and NACWA is to have dental offices follow the ADA's best management practices, which include the installation of an amalgam separator, proper maintenance of such separators, and recycling of all amalgam waste collected in dental offices. In our 2008 Effluent Guidelines Program Plan, we committed to continue to examine the use of amalgam separators by dentists. As part of our 2010 Effluent Guidelines planning process, EPA intends to reevaluate whether a rulemaking is appropriate. EPA will be issuing its 2010 program plan late this calendar year and will specifically address this issue. In closing, let me assure the subcommittee that EPA is committed to reducing mercury-related risks to citizens and the environment. In this regard, EPA and state representatives have scheduled a June 24th meeting to kick off an EPA state dialogue on mercury. The purpose of this dialogue is to identify gaps, set priorities, enhance EPA state collaboration, and identify future areas of work. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony. I'd be happy to answer any questions you or your colleagues may have. Thank you very much. Uh, we've been joined by Mr. Burton. Welcome. Um, and uh, we're going to move to a question period here of uh, witness Ms. Stoner. <clears throat> At the end of the Bush administration, EPA signed a memorandum of understanding establishing a voluntary framework to encourage dentists to adopt amalgam separators to reduce dental mercury discharge into the environment. Uh, could you tell us uh, uh, how and why that happened? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I was actually not involved in it directly myself, um, as you noted. Uh, in so your do, do you know anything about it? Well, I, I, I know that we were approached in the uh, 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 comment process of the effluent guidelines plan with a suggestion that we consider uh, an uh, agreement with um, uh, ADA uh, to uh, encourage the use of a, a technology that we thought would be uh, effective in helping to reduce uh, mercury emissions. Okay, then, well, in the written testimony, the state EPAs have testified that they had asked EPA to establish, quote, a nationwide program with the goal of substantially reducing release of mercury to the environment from dental amalgam mercury and that uh, the stakeholders would include but certainly not be limited to the American Dental Association, US EPA, states, publicly operated treatment works and dental supply manufacturers. That's quote unquote. Only 13 days later, the EPA signed a voluntary memorandum of understanding with the American Dental Association and the publicly uh, and the publicly operated uh, treatment works, but excluded the other suggested parties such as the states. Indeed, the states testify, quote, neither uh, ECOS nor the Quicksilver Caucus were involved with the development of memorandum of understanding. Uh, ECOS and Quicksilver Caucus members were not aware that the EPA was working to develop such an agreement. States were not asked to be a party to the memorandum of understanding. So why did the, could you tell us why the EPA excluded the states from the Memorandum of Understanding when enforcement of the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act is shared responsibility with state offices? Uh, I'm, I'm less able to tell you what happened in the past than I can tell you where we are going moving forward. Okay. Uh, and we do have a meeting uh, with the states on June 24th which uh, will look at mercury in uh, a variety of media. It's actually a multi-office EPA meeting. And uh, we are uh, working uh, to, looking to work collaboratively with uh, our state partners, uh, as well as uh, the in manufacturers and other interested parties in, in, in moving forward to build on the MOU. I guess so, it, so let me ask you then as a logical follow-up to your answer, if you're moving forward, does moving forward mean that you want to incorporate the state uh, EPAs as co-signatories on the agreements? Uh, 
Well, I'm not sure that we'll actually um, move forward by revising the MOU. We see the MOU as a base to build on, and so there are other things that we are considering. You want them to, if you want to build on it, though, wouldn't you want them to sign it? I, there's, uh, I haven't uh, engaged in a discussion with them about it. I don't, I don't have a view on that, but I do have a view that we would like to work closely with our state partners. We'd like to gather information from them, from the uh, dental amalgam manufacturers, from others, to improve the information we have. And I, I would say, you know, uh, consider whether additional <laughs> efforts can be made. Okay, here, here's the thing. You want to move forward. Fine. I'm with you. Except I need an answer to this. You really hadn't given me, a, I think, a, the answer I was hoping for with respect to getting the states right there with you. And, and I'm wondering why the EPA didn't involve the states in the development of the Memorandum of Understanding or even notify them that a Memorandum of Understanding was under development. Well, let me suggest on that particular point, Mr. That's a fact. I mean, you can and check on it, but yes, I, was I'm, I, I don't, look, I don't need you to validate a fact. What I need you to do is to tell me if there's any change in your policies. Well, because, you know, Mr. Mr. Jordan and I may come to some different conclusions about what states will do, but we both agree that the states ought to be, ought to be involved here. And I'm, am I hearing from you that you're going to take a different, uh, the EPA is taking a different posture with respect to involvement of the states? What I'd suggest two things. One is that we'd be happy to get back to you on, uh, with a written answer okay. as to what happened in, in uh, 2008, December of 2008. Uh, but, so we, but let's go forward. What are you going to do? Well, I, we're going to involve the states, and we're going to have a discussion about what's the most productive thing for us to work with the states on moving forward, and we're starting to do that next but month. When you're, when you're crafting that written answer, juxtapose it with what you're going to do differently. Uh, uh, Mr. Oh. Jordan. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Stunner. Thank you for being here. You, you, talk, you said several times in your response to the chairman about building on the MOU. Uh, uh, tell me, uh, just kind of refresh my memory, how is the MOU working right? I mean, when you talk about building, what does that mean? What additional costs does that mean? How does that, what, what do you mean by building on it? Well, uh, one thing is um, having to is setting goals under the MOU. Uh, that's one thing that we would like to do is to um, is to uh, set and frankly achieve some goals in terms of um, greater use of uh, mercury uh, uh, amalgam separators. That's something we'd like to do. We'd actually like to get better information than we have right now about the use of amalgam separators. We did get some information. Um, ADA did some surveys. We'd right, like I to actually get more information. Okay. One of the things we'd like to do is go to the manufacturers and get information from them and have a better baseline. How many, uh, a couple of questions, what, what do one of these separators cost? Uh, they, they, typical, typical they range in cost, um, I'd say one to two thousand dollars I would say would be uh, approximately, I could get more specific information and on that does for it, you. Does, does, let's say a, a dental office with several chairs, how many, do, do, is, is a separate, I don't know that how the, the technology works exactly, but do you have to have it at each and every uh, room where the dentist is or assistants are doing work on the patient? I, I, I believe that that's correct, that you need so to have it So it could be several thousand chair. dollars? Could be several thousand dollars. Uh, could be. Okay. And uh, how many dentists right now are are? Um, do you know how many dentists currently are using this uh, separator? In percentage wise. Uh, let, let me just clarify on the previous point. Uh, you can hook up multiple chairs to one separator, so you do need a separator for. Uh, to, okay. That so it, it hooks up to in. each chair, but you could okay. a, attach multiple chairs. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot this. How many, how many? How many dentists uh, across the country right now? I think are using this. Well, as I said, we don't have really good information on that. We'd like to get better information, including by getting information from the manufacturers. Um, uh, uh, we think it's are there, are probably... There states that, are there states that mandate right now? Yes, there are. How many? Is that 11? 12. It's 12 states. 12 states mandate. And um, uh, do you see, uh, are the results such that you see less mercury in the water supplies of those areas than you do in states that don't mandate? Well, you certainly see more use of d uh, dental amalgam separators in those states. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have less... Significant or... I'm sorry? Significant? 
significant? Yes, the, the, the rates are significantly better in states that mandate the use of the separators. That's right. And so you would have less mercury going into these uh, sewage treatment plants, and you would have less coming out. Uh, a lot of the mercury is removed in the sewage treatment Re plant. Refresh my memory. How long has the MOU been in, in place now? A couple years? Uh, since December 2008. So a, a couple years. Uh, all right. And, and have you, I, I assume you've undertaken some kind of, uh, you and the ADA, have uh, part of the memorandum is some kind of educational program. You're, you're, you're telling uh, dentists across the country why this is important, et cetera? Uh, that's right. Uh, EPAs, for EPA's part, we have done uh, uh, webinars. We've uh, provided information at conferences. We have information on our, on our web. We are trying to get the word out. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm fine right now. I'll get back. Are you able to, to well, well, I'll hit one this whole five minutes. Get back. Uh, how much time? Or if I get on the minute, I, I can yield the so you want to do first, this, first minute, Go ahead. Well, first of all, let me say that uh, Mr. Jordan is one of the finest congressmen we have, and I really like this guy, but I disagree with him. Uh, mercury is probably one of the most toxic substances in, on the face of the earth. And it's not, and it's toxic before it goes into a person's mouth, and it's toxic when it comes out, but it's not toxic when it's in their mouth. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I am absolutely convinced, after having hearings for four years on this when I was chairman, that mercury is toxic, and it should not be put in the human body in any way. Can I take my five minutes after this, Mr. Chairman, so I can go ahead after I finish this? I, I if you don't mind, I'd like well, to. Without continue. objection, I mean, it's up to Mr. Townsend. It's fine, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay we'll do it. I, I, the thing I want to get across, my grandson got nine shots in one day that seven had mercury in them. He became autistic. We used to have one in 10,000 children that are autistic. Now it's one in under 100. It's an absolute epidemic. And yet the FDA and CDC and others and, and, and continue to deny that mercury, a toxic substance put into the human body, is going to affect the neurological system. There's no question that it does. None whatsoever. I had scientists for four years from all over the world come in and testify. And mercury amalgams, when they're taken out of the tooth and flushed down the drain, now my five minutes starts, and flushed down the drain, they go in to our water supply and the sludge and all the other things that you enumerated. That should not happen. Women who are pregnant are told not to eat fish in certain areas of the country because it has mercury in them. How does it get in there? It's getting in there because we're flushing mercury down the drain. It should not be there. And I know $2,000 is a lot of money, but a dentist can afford it if he's doing his job right, and he should have separators. We should not allow mercury into the system whatsoever. I'm not an environmental nutcase. I mean, I think the environmental nutcases drive this country and this Congress nuts. But this is one area where I feel very strongly about. Mercury is toxic. It should not be put in the human being in any way at all. And we had scientists come in, and I know the ADA doesn't agree with me, and they try to get me defeated in the last election again. That's okay. But the ADA says that the mercury in a, an inert substance, like a filling, doesn't cause any problems. And yet we had scientists from all over the world testify at that table that when you have hot and cold in the mouth, it releases a vapor, and the vapor, the mercury vapor, does go into the bloodstream and does get into the brain. And we've got a huge increase in, in neurological problems among children that get all these shots. We've got an increase in people who have Alzheimer's, and I believe that part of that is caused by the mercury that's in, injected into people in shots and in the mercury amalgams. And it seems to me that we ought to get that out of anything that goes into the human being. Anything. And we certainly shouldn't be flushing it down the drains. My God, down at Newport News, Virginia, the Navy got so upset about the amount of mercury that was going from, from uh, military personnel's fillings into the water system that they mandated that they had huge barrels of it to catch the mercury fillings so it wouldn't contaminate the water supply down there. There's no question. None whatsoever. This is a nutcase stuff. There's no question that mercury should not be in the water supply. And we should do everything we can to keep it out of there. And that's why the biggest contaminator are the dentists who are flushing this stuff down the drains. And so we need to have these separators. That's important. The other thing is we need to inform people who are going into a dentist's office 
or who getting a shot or whatever it is, that there's mercury in that substance. If you're going in to get a shot and you know there's mercury in that shot, like uh, uh, thimerosal, which is a preservative in, 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 in uh, shots that we get, and if you get a shot where they have to put, uh, they have the rubber top on it and you stick the needle in, it has thimerosal in it. And thimerosal is mercury, has mercury in it. And over a long period of time, mercury accumulates in the brain. If you keep getting these shots over and over, it's going to have some kind of an adverse impact in most people or in many people. So it shouldn't be in there. But if it's in there, and if it's in amalgams, the people have a right to know. It's their life. Now, we're telling people that eat fish, be careful, because there's mercury in that fish. And if you're pregnant, you might cause a neurological problem in your baby, so don't eat those fish if it's got mercury in them. And yet we're putting mercury into the water supply, we're putting it into our mouths, we're putting it into our shots, and the FDA and HHS aren't doing anything about it. Like I said, I don't like the government to stick its nose into states' rights. I don't like the federal government taking over anything. But this is one area where the entire society is at risk as long as mercury is being injected into the human beings. I feel so strongly about it. You know what it's like to have a two-year-old child getting nine shots in one day, a perfect child starting to talk, walking and everything else, and all of a sudden he's banging his head against the wall, running around. And I talk to people at that table who are losing their homes, going bankrupt because they've got kids who have autism and they can't afford to take care of them. And yet the, the, uh, uh, the fund that we've created to take care of these people that are contaminated by this isn't doing a thing to, to solve the problem. So you can tell I'm pretty upset about it because I've watched it. I've watched thousands of mothers and come out here and show us their kids who are, who are mentally retarded because of this. I, I've talked to people who can't eat fish when they're pregnant because they're afraid their child will be hurt by the mercury in the drinking water, and yet we continue to pour it into our system, pour it into our drinking water, and the federal government doesn't do anything about it. And yet I can read to you what the FDA says. For the first time ever, the FDA publicly admitted that dental amalgam contains highly toxic mercury, and it should be, and it, they did put warnings on the, on the labels. So if they put warnings on the labels, why don't they put it in the dentist's office so people know when they go in there? Why don't, we, why don't they tell us that's not that expensive, a little cardboard saying there's mercury in these things? And so I think the FDA, I challenged the FDA after me being chairman here for six years and being on this committee now for over 20 years, 25 years. Tell the people, let the people know the facts and the country will be saved. I think somebody important said that. His name, I think it was Abraham Lincoln. Let the people know the facts and the country will be saved. And not only that, their lives might be saved. Thank you, uh, Mr. Burton. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Chair, recognize Mr. Cummings. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. The um, I was listening to my friend, Mr. Burton, and it. Um, on the one hand, he says government needs to stay out of the business of people, needs to keep a certain distance. On the other hand, he says we do need to have some kind of regulation here, and I agree that we, we do. And that leads me to these questions. As part of the uh, 22 Affluent gui Guidelines uh, planning process, EPA is committed to examining the use of amalgam separators by dentists. Is that right? Yes, sir. Please keep your voice up. In the 2008 guidelines for new and existing industrial pollution discharges into surface waters into publicly owned treatment works, the EPA decided to exclude dental offices from the scope of the guidelines. Is that correct? Uh, well, EPA decided not to move forward with an effluent guideline at that time. Yes, Congressman. And so, in, in other words, dental offices were excluded. I, I mean, well, I, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I am going somewhere, but I want to make sure you're going with me. Yeah, what, the only thing I'm trying to say is that a permanent exemption, nothing like that was done. This, what we decided was not to move forward with a rulemaking at that time, and that's the issue that we're examining again this year in our Effluent Guidelines Plan. So what would be the criteria needed for dental offices to be included 
say, in the 2010 guidelines? Well, I think what we would do is look at the various different sectors um, that need either new or uh, revised technology-based standards uh, and uh, compare this to others uh, in terms of the importance of the agency moving forward with a technology-based standard. And what would be the methodology for getting, for, for getting there, I mean, in lay terms? Um, well, I, I, I think that the, what the agency does is look at the uh, size of the problem. Obviously, we've been talking about uh, methylmercury and the human health issues associated with that, which are very significant and serious. We'd be looking at the contribution that comes from this source uh, versus other sources. Uh, we would be uh, looking at, um, for example, how six, um, how uh, the problem is developing over time, what the trend analysis is in terms of either the substitutes for dental amalgam or the use of separators. Uh, we'd be figuring out whether this is the best uh, thing to put the agency's resources on in terms of protecting human health and the environment. That's, that's the decision that we need to make in that plan. So right now, you're trying, you, I guess you're telling me you don't have enough information? Is that it? In spite of what Mr. Burton just said? Well, we have done some initial work on it, uh, uh, but I would say that we need to gather additional information. That's right, Congressman. And assuming that what Mr. Burton said was true, let's just assume that, hypothetical, uh, would, do you think dental offices would be excluded or included at that juncture? Assuming what he just said is true. Again, I think it, it depends on how many affluent guidelines we're able to do and how this compares to other risks. Now, in implementing the 2001, uh, the, the final guidance, you familiar with that? The 2001 uh, the, ambient, yeah. Yes, yes, sir, I am. Um, who had input into that document and, and um, what, what uh, do you hope it will accomplish? Uh, let me check on the first question. Okay. Did that go through public comment? Uh, uh, that uh, document, uh, that it's a guidance for how to use the water quality criteria that we've developed for methylmercury. It helps states to set standards. Uh, uh, water quality uh, standards for methylmercury to protect the public. Uh, it did go through a public comment process, so we got comments from a, a wide range of stakeholders on that document. And, uh, and that's what it's for. So what we're trying to do through that document is to help uh, states through the technical issues associated with setting a water quality standard. They can then use those standards uh, also to set limits for sewage treatment plants, and the sewage treatment plants can use that to set limits for the dentists that discharge into those uh, sewage treatment plants. So it's another uh, method uh, under the Clean Water Act to protect the public by reducing pollution. Right, I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we're going to go to a second round of questions to Ms. Stoner. Prior to signing the Memorandum of Understanding with the American Dental Association and the Organization for Publicly Owned Water Treatment Facilities, the EPA made a finding that dentists were voluntarily moving towards adopting amalgam separators. On the basis of that finding, EPA exempted dentist offices from mandatory effluent guidelines. I'd like to ask about the EPA's basis for excluding dentist office from its mandatory effluent guidelines. The ADA submitted a letter to the water docket in 2007. That's comments on the EPA study of a pretreatment requirement for dental offices which made eight arguments in favor of excluding dentist offices from mandatory requirements. In essence, that letter states, as ADA's testimony today repeats, dentists can and will act on their own. It's a quote. Did EPA take into account contrary evidence that dentists are slow to voluntarily act on their own? For instance, did EPA consider the Quicksilver Caucus's April 2008 report on mercury separator usage which noted that nearly all jurisdictions that started with purely voluntary regulations ended with mandatory regulations because the voluntary ones don't work. That finding was similar to the conclusion of the report published by the subcommittee in September 2008. So wh what do you say to that? Did 
I wasn't involved in that particular decision. But what do you I'm think? I'm confident that the agency is aware that uh, mandatory requirements, um, uh, and a matter of fact, the information is available today that show that in states where there are mandatory requirements, there is more uh, use of amalgam separators than there is in states where those programs are voluntary. And that is consistent with the agency's experience in a lot of different areas. Uh, uh, you'll have more widespread compliance if you actually have a mandate. I think that uh, that's pretty well demonstrated. Well, it might be pretty well demonstrated, but that's not where the EPA was because they exempted dentist offices from mandatory effluent programs. So using your logic, well, of course, of course it's mandatory. Well, that's not what EPA did. Uh, e EPA did not grant a permanent extension, uh, ex exemption, excuse me, to... Um, what was their basis for excluding uh, dentist offices from mandatory effluent guidelines in the first place? I I'd prefer to get back to you in writing on that. Okay, uh, that'd be fine. Uh, because it was a decision I was I'll not involved I'll look, in. I'll look forward to reading it. Now, uh, will you look at the screen, please? Uh, staff. Uh, Ms. Stoner, uh, this graph depicts the actual sales trends of mercury separators to dentists by the largest manufacturer in the nation. Uh, sales pick up dramatically just prior to mandatory regulations kicking in, which is depicted by the shaded column. Now, isn't this evidence that dentists respond to mandatory regulations requiring adopt, uh, adoption of mercury separators? I, I would agree that it appears to show that, yes, yes, sir. Well, I'd like you to look at the trend lines to the left of the shaded bar there. And the staff, uh, does uh, Ms. Stoner have a copy of, of this, by the way? Thank you. Why don't you, you take, I, I'd like you to look at it closely here. Okay. Thank you. So I, I have it now. Th thank you very much. I, you. I'd like you to look at the trend lines to the left of the shaded bar. Okay. You see, how, you see how the purchase rate is? See how the purchase rate decreases the further away you go from the shaded bar? Uh, that yes, period, th that's the voluntary period that preceded the mandatory requirements. So, you know, there's evidence here that dentists don't generally adopt mandatory separators on a voluntary basis. Uh, there's I mean, some would, you, would you agree? Uh, there's cer there? certainly some variation, but in general, uh, the uh, sales certainly go up uh, after the, uh, the uh, regulation date's effective date. That's correct. And, and if you look at the voluntary period, so, so you have mandatory regulations, compliance goes up, voluntary regulations don't appear to go, uh, appear to be low compliance, right? I can't really what tell the what the voluntary program is that <coughs> precedes the bar, but it certainly looks like the regulation makes the sales go up. That I can tell. So d don't you think that this uh, shows voluntary efforts by dentist trade associations since the uh, signing of the memorandum of understanding? Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm going to go to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Stoner, did you agree with my, my good friend and colleague, Mr. Burton, his, um, his analysis of the situation, his conclusion on the situation? Uh, I thought he made a number of excellent points. Uh, certainly his points about the dangers associated with methylmercury are well, are well taken. And I, I also thought his point about uh, people being uh, probably less likely to get amalgam fillings if they had better information about the, methyl, uh, the mercury uh, in amalgam fillings was also a, a compelling point. Then I think the chairman's question is the $64,000 question. If, in fact, the EPA thinks it that, it's that bad, and I, I don't know. I mean, typically I think the EPA overreaches on a lot of things. But if, in fact, you think Mr. Burton's analysis is correct, why the decision on the memorandum of understanding, why was that made? Uh, again, I mean, I if, the, if, the, if, if this is as terrible as my, my good friend points it out to be, it seems to me you'd be making the rules, doing the things that you think are going to protect them. So, I, I mean, that's, that's the big question. We'd like an answer. Right. I, mean, there's I don't know if it's right or wrong. I mean, look, 
But based on what you just said in response to Mr. Burton's statements, it seems to me we need that answer. Uh, I, I think there's two different things we're talking about, one of which is the use of dental amalgam, uh, uh, you know, by patients. And, um, and that is a uh, decision that's partly environmental and partly medical. And uh, uh, we think that the FDA has, uh, is better situated to so make the, that decision. So, so then, then, let, me, let me clarify. So you think uh, mercury in some other forms, what Mr. Burton had to say, is right on target, but specifically to the, the filling put in the patient's teeth while they're in the dental office doesn't rise to the, maybe not as, maybe not as bad as Mr. Burton might have said. Is, yeah. that, is that your conclusion? No, no, it I don't. It seemed to be I, so based on what, what the EPA's decision is. Okay, been. well, I may not be making myself clear, so let me try to do better. What I'm saying is that the EPA is not in the lead role in deciding what dentists use in, uh, in the dentistry that they practice. Uh, there are other agencies that are better situated to make decisions about those medical issues. EPA is looking at the issues of uh, mercury emissions, uh, air emissions, and uh, yeah. uh, mercury in wastewater discharges. And uh, uh, what I'm saying is that it, it, re it is a concern. Mercury in wastewater discharges is a concern, and that's one that we're evaluating at the agency along with other uh, pollutants of concern and uh, that cause human health or environmental impacts. Well, but, but I, I just want to be clear, the memorandum of understandings between the EPA and the ADA, correct? Uh, yes, sir, but it's not about the use of dental amalgams. It's about uh, um, use of amalgam separators. So that uh, doesn't, either way, whether the patient uses dental amalgam or uh, some other kind of uh, uh, you know, cavity, I'm not a dentist, but any, <laughs> some other kind of uh, filling, uh, then um, uh, the, the mercury would be captured in the amalgam and it would then stay out of the sewage treatment plant and um, stay out of the waste, wastewater of the sewage treatment plant. That's what our agreement is about. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Burton. Well, first of all, I appreciate uh, your acknowledging some of the things that we talked about. I appreciate that, Ms. Stoner. The one thing that kind of bothers me is one agency kind of passing the buck to another agency and back and forth and back and forth. Uh, I had people from the HHS and, and FDA before the committee, and when my grandson became autistic, I said, would you mind if I injected you with the amount of uh, thimerosal with mercury in it uh, that my grandson got in one day, and they said, well, it, it wouldn't affect them, but they wouldn't want it injected into them. It was kind of an interesting uh, answer they had. But here, here's what the FDA has, the position they've taken. For the first time ever, the FDA publicly admitted that dental amalgam contains highly toxic mercury and therefore requires a variety of warnings on the product label. That is clearly a significant improvement over the FDA's former position that mercury amalgams are 100 percent safe. That was their previous position. Unfortunately and inexplicably, inexplicably, new warning requirements have nothing to do with patient safety. It's just putting it on the label on the, on the, on the uh, product. And the FDA still does not require dentists to warn patients in any way about the harmful neurotoxins in the dental amalgam. Considering the fact that in 2006, the FDA's own panel, own panel of outside experts concluded that it is, quote, not reasonable for the FDA to have the position that mercury amalgam fillings are safe. How can the FDA not insist that dentists warn patients about the dangers? They had this outside group come in and look at it, and they said, well, we can't take the position that it's safe, which means there's a real question about whether or not it's safe. Now, if dentists want to go ahead and continue to use that, then I think the obligation is clear let the patients know that it's in there. And 90% of the people who have dental fillings that are amalgams do not know that it has mercury in it. And so they're being exposed without their knowledge. Uh, I, I think the, the thing that, that, that has bothered me the most is that we're having such opposition from the dentists because they're getting information from the FDA and HHS that says this is not harmful, and yet they're not supposed to flush it down the drain, and they know that it's toxic if they get it on them before they, before they put it in the mouth and they mix it all up. 
but they've been told that it's not harmful. And so the dentists, I think, rightfully say, well, you know, why are you telling us what to do when the FDA and HHS says there's no problem? And so the dentists say, oh, my guys like me are nuts. And uh, maybe that's true, I don't know. But, but the fact of the matter is it, they're now starting to admit that there is a serious problem. So what I can't understand is why the FDA and HHS and the EPA don't get together in a panel and sit down and say, how do we make sure that this is properly regulated and properly brought to the attention of the American public? And I, I would suggest that that's something that should be done. EPA has the authority. FDA has the authority to, to do a lot of these things. And the other thing I'd like to say before my time is up, I talk to the pharmaceutical companies, the presidents of these companies, major companies, Merck, uh, Eli Lilly, a uh, whole bunch of them. And I said, if you will put more money into the Vaccine Injury Compensation Fund to help people who've been damaged, if you'll get mercury out of all the vaccines, adult and children, and they can do that in an economical, satisfactory way, then I will introduce legislation that will protect you from class action lawsuits. I'll do everything I can to make sure that you're not going to face any harmful financial problems because of past experiences. Now, when I said that, that one out of 10,000 people used to have autism, kids, now it's one in less than 100, we know there's a big problem. So if we protect the pharmaceutical companies by giving them protection from class action lawsuits, if they'll do these things, get the mercury out and put more money into the vaccine engineering compensation fund, I don't know why they won't do it. And I will do the same thing for the dentists. If dentists are afraid that they're going to be sued by people that have neurological problems that they allege came from a amalgam or amalgams that they used in filling their teeth, I'll do everything I can to protect them as long as we get the mercury out of the product and get it out of people's mouths. Until that time, I hope that the EPA, uh, the FDA, and HHS will get together and come up with some way to make sure the public is aware of what's going on. Okay? Thank you. Would you carry that message back? Uh, yes, sir, I will. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to begin the third round of uh, questioning. It'll be the final round of questioning of this witness. Before I begin, I just want to say to my colleague, Mr. Burton. Okay. Yes, sir. I, I just want to uh, say this before we begin the third round of questions, that uh, I have watched for years your advocacy on this and other health issues. And I'm proud to serve with you in this Congress. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really, really appreciate you, it. You've really, you've, you have really been outstanding and courageous, courageous in your uh, pursuit of the, of the questions uh, underlying the uh, effects of mercury in vaccines in a whole range of areas. And I, and I, and I really appreciate it. Well, thank you very yeah. much, and I wish you would call my wife and tell her that. She doesn't appreciate <laughs> Well, I, you know, I, I may... A little I'm, levity won't hurt. If, if that anything I can do to help you, Mr. Burton, I'll be glad to. Okay. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to a final round of uh, questions of this, this witness. I, I'm concerned that EPA signed a memorandum of understanding with someone who can't make the change the memorandum of understanding seeks. When my staff spoke with a top official at the ADA about steps ADA has taken to measure the effectiveness of his outreach campaign, such as tracking if dentists are using uh, best management practices or even viewing the brochure it produced. We learned that the ADA is not even tracking that. How can ADA optimize its efficacy in promoting compliance with its best management practices if it doesn't track dentist compliance with its best management practices or even whether they look at its brochure? I, I agree with you, Congressman. It would be better to have more outreach and more, uh, uh, more installation of those amount well, of What we're seeing is it's it's, it's a perfunctory performance here. We've learned that just this month, ADA held a conference in Chicago for Illinois dentists on a topic of limiting mercury pollution from dental offices. Now, the results weren't particularly impressive. Of the 8,500 dentists in the state, of which 6,600 are members of the State Dental Society, only 21 came to the conference. Now, Ms. Stoner, uh, I'm calling this to your attention because I think it's worth you looking at the ADA's um, 
outreach efforts and to, uh, and to see if they can be uh, more encouraging. Um, you have a report from the Quicksilver Caucus of the State EPA offices, a report from this subcommittee and the most recent sales data of the largest seller of mercury separators all showing that dentists are not, in fact, voluntarily adopting mercury separators in significant numbers. Yet the memorandum of understanding depends upon their doing so. Given the demonstrated importance of a realistic prospect for mandatory requirements for obtaining dentist adoption of amalgam separators, I'm wondering what procedure EPA would follow to reconsider its exemption of dentist offices from effluent guidelines. We, we will be gathering additional information. We agree with you about the need to get additional information uh, uh, in order to make a determination, and we have committed to doing that, including from the manufacturers. I'm, I'm wondering uh, why you wouldn't strongly say right now that you intend to rescind the dentist office exemption, uh, exception as of, say, the 2012 effluent guidelines, unless you see verifiable compliance with the Memorandum of Understanding uh, goals in 2010 and 2011? Uh, we have a process we have to go through on the effluent guidelines planning, and I don't want to get ahead of that process. Uh, so we, we are committing to you that we'll look at it in that process and make a determination. Ms. Stoner, we have a process here, too. And what's noteworthy is that there's nothing that's separating individuals from both political parties who are determined to get to the truth of exactly what's happening here. So I understand about your process. Our process here is going to continue to go uh, deeply into what I personally feel are the shortcomings of the EPA's uh, responsibility in this regard. And I come to this not as someone who is a uh, uh, consistent foe of the Environmental Protection Agency. I'm a friend. But I'm such a good friend that if I see something wrong, I'm going to tell you. So, uh, Chair, recognize Mr. Jordan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I will just be real brief, and we'll get to the second panel. I want to talk with the uh, witness from the ADA. But the, the, the Chairman, in, in his uh, comments, talked about the fact that only 21 dentists, I believe, showed up at a conference in, in, in Illinois. Um, you know, while the conference obviously was important, talking about mercury, I would just remind members of the committee that, you know, these guys are small business owners. They got to attend to their practice. They got to attend to their meeting the needs of their patients uh, in their communities. Um, it's not always easy just to pack up and go. So we, I think there's a balance we have to keep in mind as we, we, we look at this whole issue and um, evaluate what is the best means and best process as we move forward. And as I said, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back and wait for, uh, wait for the second panel. I thank the gentleman. Chair recognizing Ms. Watson. Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to thank you. And uh, I also want to thank Member Burton. He's not in the room at the moment. We have been working on this issue ever since I've been here, and I'm completing my 10th year, and I will be retiring after this year. I worked on the same issue on mercury pollution when I was chairing the Health and Human Services Committee in California for seven years years. I finally had a governor that a p appointed a dental board who looked at the dental amalgams and said, we see some problems here. <laughs> that particular governor was recalled, and this has been hidden again. Uh, so what I want to do, I will uh, wait until the second panel comes up, and I'd like to read my opening statement, if I may. And I yield back my time. Uh, and uh, I, I would just say to the, to the gentle lady, if uh, she would like to read her opening statement uh, now. Now, all right. Uh, and then when you uh, are concluded, so, so that uh, Ms. Stoner will have the benefit of hearing it. Right. And then when you conclude, I will call the second panel. Thank you so very much. Without objection. I've been a staunch opponent of mercury amalgams. And for those of you that do not know what an amalgam is, 
It's a substance that you put into a cavity to fill it. And it's what is in that amalgam. And the amalgam looks like silver. It's 50% mercury. Uh, SB 65 in California of about 20 years ago rates mercury as the most toxic substance in the environment. So I have been an opponent of mercury amalgam since my days in the California State Senate where I helped pass a law that requires a fact sheet about dental fillings being given to consumers without any information about what's being put into their mouth. I believe that it's very important, it's essential for consumers to know about the toxins they are putting into their bodies, especially when it is one that is implanted into their mouths and helpless children's mouths and senior citizens and could possibly affect them for the rest of their lives. For this reason, this Congress, I introduced the CHOMP Act, H.R. 4615, CHOMP. <laughs> this bill will require dentists to give consumers a fact sheet prepared by the Food and Drug Administration outlining the dangers of each type of filling. Now, you know, uh, in California, and I would hope in the rest of the country, we're concerned about the atmosphere. We were the first state to outlaw and ban smoking on airplanes in California airspace. It took us 14 years to do that, and then the rest of the country followed, and now it's global. Now, I'm sure that we all know that mercury is one of the most toxic substances. If you don't know, we're going to tell you. Third on the CERLA, and we refer to it as CERLA, list of toxic chemicals. We also know that amalgamum releases sufficient amounts of mercury that can be absorbed by our bodies. That is the reason why, if you're in California, you are warned not to eat tuna along the western coast of Southern California because in a dental office, you know, what do you do with the waste? You put it into a tube, it goes right out to the plant and into the ocean and gets into the sea life and gets into the shell life and so on. That is a fact. Mercury poisoning has been shown to cause mental disorders, autoimmune disorders, and other chronic illnesses. It is thought that mercury also plays a role in Alzheimer's disease and in MS. It is a documented, documented fact that mercury can also transfer from pregnant women through the placenta to the developing fetus. Children and fetuses are especially at risk because of the developmental risk posed by mercury. Yet women who are pregnant or plan on becoming pregnant are not told of the risk associated with their new mercury fillings. Everyone likes to show their new fillings. Look at the silver I have in my mouth. So informer, informing consumer is the right thing to do. I think everyone needs to know what is added to whatever they put in their body because, you know, if you look at ads like on cigarettes and tobacco, you know, it tells you what it could do to your health. And I think you make the choice, you suffer the consequences. I know that many of these ill effects are real. In my time fighting for this issue, I have met so many people who have told me their health histories are being constantly fatigued after getting their mercury amalgam fillings of their lives being crippled by chronic headaches, of being told that they have an unknown autoimmune disorder only to be 
Relieved of their troubles after they remove their mercury amalgam fillings that I sit in front of you as a witness and a victim. I had my mercury amalgams, Mr. Chair, put into my mouth when I was nine years old. My father was a police officer, so you could practically get it done free. I have suffered from allergies all of my life until an investigating team from abroad came in and they said, my God, you're suffering from mercury poisoning. I went to my dentist, asked him to remove, and he would not. Very few people know how to do it. I had to go to Mexico, Ms. Stoner, and have them. It took me six weeks and was very expensive. It has changed my life. It has changed my looks. And it changes the aging process. I can tell you that. I can tell you that. And the doctor who did it was educated here, and he would not do the mercury fillings that were required at his university. So he left and went to the University of Mexico. And he lives here in the States and goes over the border to practice because dentists will tell me no. And I didn't get the backing of the EPA. So that's the situation. It really made a difference. And he didn't give me medication. He gave me herbs. And he told me, take these herbs till you clean your system. And I tell you, it has made a difference. People have accused me of having a facelift. No, I took the mercury and I tell everyone I can, remove your mercury amalgams. So in response to the CHOMP Act, the American Dental Association, quoting the FDA, issued a statement saying that mercury amalgams are safe. That is a lie. Quote me. And if there's any press in this room, quote me, please. I have the facts. Uh, where's my staff? Hold up my book. Oh, hold it up for me. You can come to my office. I'll share this with you. We've done research nationally and internationally. We're killing ourselves because, as one group of dentists said to me, you know, people of color don't like to go to the dentist. And so that's the reason why we continue to use amalgams, because they're safely combined and well sealed. I said, do you ever consider that kids go skating or biking and they fall and crack their teeth? Happens every day. Do you ever consider that they get a teeth pulled out? Happens every day. And if you want to test, there's a probe you can pull in your mouth and you can see the vapors from the mercury going to your T-zone. Now, what's at the top of your T-zone? Yeah, I see a lady in the back. She says, what's at the top of your T-zone? Your brain. And what's covering your brain? A thin skin called the meninges. And guess what? Mercury affects the meninges of the brain. So why do so many of our children do poorly in school? because they chew on paint on their cribs that have lead in it. And then the mercury that they put in, nine years old, in their teeth also goes up. So, you know, just think about that. And we're going to find why so many women are having cancer and breast cancer now. It's something we add in or something in that can and so on. We're going to continue to do the research until we can convince that mercury has no place in the human body. Now, if you read FDA's rule, FDA itself admits that the report that was published by Trans Agency Working Group on the Health Effects of Dental Amalgam in 2004 concluded that there were, quote, important data gaps, including whether low-level mercury vapor results in neurotoxicity, I am a witness, and I'll testify on any stand to it. Also, studies that have been performed do not account for mercury from other sources, nor are they sufficiently long-term. And that is why we need to inform people so they can make their own choices. We have for years informed and warmed and warned consumers about the risk of consuming fish 
with a high mercury content. Now we are learning that dentist offices contribute approximately, get this, 50% of mercury in waste water, much of which makes it into the environment. In 2002, a report from the University of Chicago concludes this number could be as high as 70 percent. After the passage of the mercury ban by then Senator Obama, it is baffling that we still allow dentists to pollute our water and air with mercury. Mercury has vapors that are always being emitted, always being emitted, especially when they can install a $500 mercury separator that has the ability to capture more than 90% of their mercury waste. And I've been thinking so much about how our seawaters now are polluted down in the Gulf because of the escaping oil and they're trying to break it up, and whatever they're pulling, putting in to break up the modules, killing the fish and the birds and so on. We need to be more proactive and wiser. Additionally, dental mercury amalgams contribute to the mercury burden in the environment through a very unlikely source, and that's crematoria, crematoriums. As dentists continue to install mercury amalgams into mouths, these installations release mercury into the air during the cremation. Is there no end to the ill effects of mercury right to the end of the life process and the disposal of the bodies? So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I want to say that I firmly believe that mercury amalgams should not be used. If the, F, if the ADA is going to insist on their continued use, then dentists have the obligation to inform their patients in advance. And dentists also have the obligation to prevent environmental harm. You remember you take that hypocritical or hypocritical by installing, you'll get it, installing mercury separators. As a voluntary program has not worked, it is time the EPA takes the initiative to regulate mercury in water and air, and one very important aspect of that air is the pollution of mercury amalgam. Mr. Chairman, I really want to thank you and uh, the uh, minority member, again, for holding this hearing, and uh, as you can hear.